The following program is presented by the HTM Podcast Network. This is your United States of America. Saturday, July 20th, 2019, and you know what that means. Oh, it's Saturday night. Yeah. That's right, it's Saturday night, and you are tuned into the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast, powered by the Roar Network at thegorillaposition.com. Presented by Hameen Media. <laughs> And of course, in association with Last Word on ProWrestling.com. On this week's show, we're talking the G1, the return of a horseman, three stages of hell, and a whole lot more. But before we dive in, it's my obligation to remind you this is a podcast by the fans for the fans, bringing you all the news that is news from across the professional wrestling world. Find us online, hitting the marks. Dot com. My name is Jargo. I'll be your host for the day. Give it up for my tag team partner. He is the voice of Battle on the Border Pro Wrestling. The man, the myth, the legend, the real RBV. Rick, welcome back to your show. It's me, it's me. It's that all of the beat of the beat. Rick Pickery back again. The Hitting Works Pro Wrestling Podcast. And Jargo, you know it just as well as I do. It is a hot one here in the Midwest. I am sweating like a Democrat on election day. But I have to admit, life is good. No, wait a minute. Life is grand. The announcement coming out today that KFC is going to begin offering deep fried chicken skin. That's right. We're not messing around with the meat and the bone anymore. We're just serving you up the good stuff. When everybody likes to just peel off that skin, that's the sweet stuff. And now they're going to give us, a, you know, give us that. I'm just hoping that it comes along with a, with a gravy dipper. Well, you know, KFC lost my business. They're entirely too political for my taste. I, I, I draw the line when you start putting Cheetos on a chicken sandwich. Rick, I just, I can't, I can't do it. I am not that inclusive. I am not that all inclusive that I can support Cheetos on a chicken sandwich. Hey, you know, they're out there trying to different markets. They're trying to get that different reach, but I have to agree with you, man. You know, why does everyone have to mess with everything? You know, like good old vodka. What was wrong, you know, back in the 80s, 90s? You just had vodka. Now, now there's hundreds of flavors of this stuff. I, I, I got to confess, though, man, I really like that birthday cake vodka. I really like it. I like it so much I quit drinking. That's how much I like birthday cake vodka. You know what? Here's You know what they, you know what they had to do back in, you know, like before the 90s when they wanted birthday cake vodka? Eat birthday cake and then drink vodka? Yes. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I, why mess with these things? Yeah, go out, support your local Russians, buy some vodka. Huckleberry, we've got a lot to talk about, and you talk about things that they screw with all the time. You know, one thing that they haven't screwed with in a long, long time is the G1 Climax. Well, outside of actually increasing the field and making it even more awesome... Rick, this tournament has been absolutely stellar. I know that you've been getting up to watch all these shows. Just kind of overall thoughts before we talk about the Thursday, Friday, and this morning show. What are you thinking of the tournament thus far? Uh, you know, right now, really enjoying it. And I, I think it's it's more so, I mean, we're always, we knew we were going to get this level of action. And I love how diverse this field is as well. And so many unique matchups that we've already seen so many to look forward to. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is in Mindy standing. You know, in some ways, I mean, I almost expected them to be flipped a little bit. Or, you know, some people that are really surprised me that are struggling at the bottom here. Uh, and some of them, even, yeah, even Moxley, you know, reading his block. Uh, I knew he'd have a strong showing, but i, I got to believe, first time here, an outsider, such strong booking for him. Uh, I'm really intrigued to see how these stories play out because... You know, with outside of Wrestle Kingdom, I mean, this is the second biggest event that they have over there, and they put so much into the booking here and so much depth into the story. I mean, on every level, this is so intriguing. We're going to run through all the matches, get you all the results here. And yes, we are going to talk about John Moxley, who had the best match that he's had in the last five years on Friday. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's start things off with Thursday. 
that saw Kenta defeat Lance Archer, Evil defeats Sonata in the battle of tag team partners, Kazuchika Okada downs Bad Luck Fale, Hiroshi Tanahashi finally escapes Zack Sabre Jr., and Kota Ibushi and Will Ospreay actually pull it together enough to go out and have, you know, just another four and a quarter star match. Um... Ibushi getting the win this time over the aerial assassin. Huckleberry Thursday looked like it was going to be an incredible card. I was in no way, shape, or form disappointed. Uh, The matches that absolutely stand out to me, Lance Archer just making an absolute statement, not just in this matchup with Kenta, but throughout the entire tournament. Evil and Sonata was freaking fantastic, and Ibushi and Osprey actually toned it back just enough that they could get through this match oh yeah okada and fale just have incredible chemistry as do tanahashi and zack saber jr go ahead man P- pick your poison which of these do you actually want to talk about try let's wherever you want to go man it's just it, follow it, it, the leader incredible showing um Kenta in Archer, I, we'll talk about Kenta a little bit later um, w- when we talk about his matchup with Evil because myself and 8-Track Brown from the PW Hustle, we were having a little bit of a conversation this morning regarding Kenta. Uh, let, let's talk about Evil and Sonata, the battle of tag team partners. These guys are hitting every reversal known to mankind to every one of their partner's moves. They're busting out each other's moves. This thing was just a whole lot of fun if you're a fan of LIJ. Oh, absolutely. I, I think going in, you know, you had high expectations, so much chemistry between these two and the history and all that, everything that's going into it, high expectations, as I said, but they absolutely deliver again. So Evil presents Sonata with the fist bump at the end of the match. Sonata acknowledges the fist bump, very different th- from what we would see from him this morning. Rick, is it all fine and dandy again inside of LIJ? I, I, I'm not really picking that up right now. I, I think, you know, it's, maybe you get some shades of that, but I'm looking for that big swerve. But, you know, time and time again, how many, you know, as we as, as long as we've been doing this show and, and talking about it here, it, it seems to be a running theme, you know, how, how long, you know, is everything okay in LIJ? Well, and we're going to see it in the B block when eventually Tetsuya Naito is going to have to take on Shingo Takagi. But th- this Evil and Sonata thing has me very, very intrigued, especially with what happened with Sonata and Ibushi this morning. I almost wonder if the roles flipped. Like, Evil's cool now. Like, Evil's proved what he needs to prove. But it almost feels like he transferred the chip off of his shoulder and onto Sonata's for me. Well, I think, you know, that's, the, you know, the story really lies is passing the buck here. And I guess no, no pun intended there, but, you know, who's going to be that next one? It's it's almost like a game of musical chairs. It kind of feels that way right now inside of Los Angobernobiles. Uh Ibushi defeats Osprey. Um, this was much more of a striking matchup as opposed to the aerial insanity that you would expect from these two guys, although it did have plenty of that as well. Um, they both survived. That's the good news. Kota Ibushi finally gets on the board with two points. That's also good news. Rick, how long can Osprey keep this up? And I feel like we've been saying this now for seven freaking months, but how long can he genuinely keep this up? Well, hey, you know, this is a, a point he's, that he is trying to make here. He's the best in the world. He's pushing through anything and everything. I think that's that grand story here with him. It's it's absolutely incredible what's going on with Will Ospreay. Not just inside of the G1 Climax, all of 2019. This guy's just going out and having incredible matches. It's, it's almost August, and we're still talking about this insane run that Will Ospreay has been on. Let's go ahead. We'll jump to Friday. I think it's, oh. it, let's, real, real, real quick with Ospreay there. You know, it's going to be really interesting to see where he ends up on this year's uh, PWI 500. I'm very curious where he ends up on the Wrestle Kingdom card, assuming that he makes it to Wrestle Kingdom. Is Ospreay not the number one wrestler in the world right now? I mean, as far as just 2019 goes, both inside of a kayfabe sense and inside of a what my eyes are showing me sense. 
Well, I think that's what that's why I brought up that point. You know, where would where, you know right now? Where would you place him inside that five hundred? I mean, would it be just like one of those big, you know, like as big as a shock as when Dean Malenko won the number one? You could see him, you know, grabbing that that honor. I don't think there's anybody even close. I mean, r- really, the only ones that come close when you think of in a side of a kayfabe sense, right? You have Becky Lynch, I guess, would have to be considered. Seth Rollins, Brock Lesnar. Kofi Kingston, Kazuchika Okada. That's it, right? But I, you know, well, no, I think outside of that, um, you know, really, this would be a great thing, you know, to throw out there. Anyone's listening, want to drop us a line on this thing. Let us know what you think. Maybe like your top five so far, so far for the 500. And remembering that comes inside of a kayfabe sense, uh, you know, Matt Taven's got to be right in there. Yeah, Matt Taven should be in there. Absolutely. Uh, whoever wins um, the first AEW championship is going to be in this mix, whether they deserve to be or not. Well, I'd almost say, you know, in that sense, you know, too, uh, you, if that, especially if that's Jericho, he needs to be in that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in that case, Ed, yes, uh, Seth Rollins overcoming the beast, you know, grabbing the Universal Championship, even though he just lost it, but he has a chance to get that back. But I think he's the bottom of the list that we're talking about right now, because in order to do so, he had to punch Brock Lesnar in the dick. Yeah, I, yeah, I look at that, you know, he's he's definitely, at you know, on the back end, if we're looking at those accomplishments there, uh, inside of WWE, obviously, I think Kofi is is light years ahead of him, you know, somebody that came out of absolutely nowhere, you know, that, that horse coming around on the outside, cut to the inside, and is absolutely a workhorse. I mean, Kofi goes out there and defends all the time, uh, and, he, and even though he's got his little quirks about him, he is pretty much an honorable champion. Inside of a kayfabe sense, the WWE Wrestler of the Year is clearly Becky Lynch. It's not even close. She won the Royal Rumble. Well, I, uh, she she headlined WrestleMania. She pinned Ronda Rousey. She won both the the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships at the same time. Like clearly, in a kayfabe sense, Becky Lynch thus far is the WWE Wrestler of the Year. Oh yeah, um, no no question about it. Let's uh let's go ahead. We'll throw things over to Friday. Shingo Takagi. Defeats Tai Chi. That made me very, very happy. Jeff Cobb defeats Juice Robinson, getting his first points of this G1. I actually enjoyed that match tremendously. I'd love to see it for a U.S. or never open weight championship. Um, Tatsuya Naito defeats Hiroki Goto. And then we have the two matches that everybody is talking about, Rick. We'll start off with the first one. Fucking Yano! Strikes again. And he gets the switchblade Jay White. Rick, I've been telling you for what seems like months at this point, it's going to happen. Switchblade Jay White is going to become my favorite professional wrestler. This was a big tipping point in the scales for me. I really want to see Switchblade murder Yano now. Well, it just falls in. You know, it, anyone that, that murders it can go after and absolutely end the run of, of Yano, the plague, if you will, in the mind of Michael Jarko, the plague of Yano. Anyone that can bring that to an end is going to have a special spot in your heart and immediately go into your top three, maybe of all time, correct? Yeah, I, I, he's going to be right up there with Macho Man and Flair. Yeah, whoever it is. I'm looking I, at you, Moxley. I, 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 I'm thinking here, you know, what's really intriguing, I was talking about these stories and I was talking about top and the bottom of these blocks. What is up with Jay White? We are having this conversation week in, week out through through the G1. Where is he at in the booking? Where is he standing? Is he going to get booted from that lead spot in Bullet Club? Obviously, we, we both still feel, Jargo, that they, they are still high on Jay White, but what is the plan? What is the direction? That's one of those, those big intriguing points that you're watching here. He is struggling. He has yet to capture a win. Is he going to be that story that turns it around on this backside? And somehow as we're going into the last few shows, he's got an outside shot or is he going to seek, you know, some sort of bigger redemption here or, or is he falling from grace in a way, or is he going to take a step back here throughout the rest of the year and then maybe rebuild as we get into 2020? You know, I can't help but draw the comparison and maybe this is being done 100% on purpose because Finn Balor is quite possibly the biggest troll inside of the pro wrestling business and 
I can assure you, Finn Balor heard this damn interview that John Moxley did. I, I don't remember if it was the Jericho interview or the Wade Keller interview. And Moxley tells the story of his exit from WWE, how he asked for some time off. And he knew full damn well that he wasn't going to re-sign his contract. This was back in February. He went and shot all these videos for his breakout of the prison and the the um, Death Rider vignette that he did for New Japan Pro Wrestling, which is straight from the mind of Dusty Rhodes. Finn Balor's kind of doing the same thing here, Rick. We, we've heard that he has not re-signed a contract. Now he's requesting time off. I'm seeing Switchblade Jay White losing all of his matches inside of the G1. You know, I pitched that idea inside the locker room that Finn Balor get the hell out of the WWE. Of course, everybody goes to AEW. You brought up him returning to New Japan Pro Wrestling. It seems like all the cards are aligning, doesn't it? Oh, I absolutely agree with you 100%. And, you know, immediately everybody, you know, that, that's just the hot ticket right now. You know, the, the hot hand that you play is go to AEW. Uh, and I think in, in many ways right now, you know, AEW is still an unproven commodity. And when you talk about your, your ultimate worth, where you can really reestablish yourself and get that boom, for someone like Finn Balor, it's not to stay here in the States. It's about to go back to where he found his original fame, and that's in New Japan, and that's with Bullet Club. Man, if he comes walking out in that real rock and roller jacket and dethrones the switchblade Jay White, just like that, Bullet Club is once again the hottest thing in the freaking world. Because that's the one thing that's really getting lost in this switchblade story and what's going on with switchblade. What's going on with Bullet Club? Because Bullet Club is way down right now. Like they've almost hit chaos level as far as this faction is no longer important. Well, it's and it's not so much the you know it's where it's not really important. Obviously, you have that that drastic drop off. I mean, they were one of the hottest things in the world. You know, when they had that driving buck, you know, the bucks driving that merchandise machine behind them, and, and now you know they still have a little bit of that click. You know, people that have stayed true to it that you know get behind, you know, what the Tongans are doing and all that. But overall, uh, the the shine has worn off. This is the lowest they've been, right? But absolutely. And they need something major to, to kickstart this thing, to revigorate it. And what better than going back to the OG to bring back Prince Devitt, who even, even through the terrible, absolutely terrible booking and, and creative decisions and handling through WWE, he still has that, that loyal flock. That, that people that are going to follow him, and no matter what they do, no matter how, you know, what 50 50 has done and how they have just absolutely destroyed the demon, his true fan base, that core, and even those that gravitated towards him since joining the WWE Universe, they have stayed loyal to him and they are going to follow. And you got to believe, you know, he's good. And with that being said, you know, and the need for Bullet Club, New Japan with their expansion, for them to really open eyes. In hell, even AEW will see the importance of that. Every promotion is going to see the importance of that. He would be one of the hottest free agents within, you know, the last decade of professional wrestling, just outside of that importance. Because I'm not, I, if, this is no secret there. I, I'm not an over the top Finn Balor guy. Never really have been. Even going back from, you know, Prince and, and New Japan, I didn't really get, it really didn't connect with me. But outside of that, you know, if I'm a, I am a marketing PR guy, but if I'm in one of those positions, I absolutely see the worth in here in him. And I am pushing him to the moon because I want to maximize my financial capabilities on two different continents, because not only would that reinvigorate the bullet club in Japan immediately, the bullet club is cool in the United States again, too. Well, it's just, it's just not two continents. I mean, you're talking global. You're, you're taking the bullet club back to that top level globally. And that's what you need there. And I, and I believe, too, you know, if he outs Jay White, I mean, you got a hot program in itself just between those two for a year traveling the world. Now, let me ask, does the Bullet Club, do they still have individually their deal with Hot Topic? I'm not sure, to be completely honest. I'm not sure. I haven't been to a Hot Topic in months, so I don't even know what their stock looks like. But I, I have to assume so because I know a deal was strict 
with uh, LIJ as well. You could get LIJ merch at Hot Topic. So even if that deal was through the Bucks, I'm sure that once the that deal was concluded, that New Japan and Hot Topic could absolutely make that work. Well, I, it was under my understanding that maybe the Bucks got the deal done, but the deal was from New Japan. Well, New Japan owns the Bullet Club trademark, so they they would have That's to be I'm in saying. on it. So they they would be in on it. So you know if if that if that deal is still in place, you know even an outlet like Hot Topic, they're going to have to be loving that because it's going to be driving their sales again because Bullet Club will once again be cool. Now on the flip side of all of this, you know we're talking about you know Finn possibly playing WWE here and he's taking that Moxley blueprint and trying to ride his way out. Maybe, you know, you're talking about trolling in there. Maybe he's just trolling the WWE and throwing it out there. And someone in management's going to be like, wait a minute, we just went through this with Moxley. We have got to, you know, we've got to cut this off with Finn. But we got to, we got to sweeten this deal to make sure we keep him here. You know, because William Alessio is now reporting that they are going to bring Finn back for SummerSlam. And that will be his ultimate write off before he takes an extended leave. And then maybe going into 2020, we're going to see him join the club. Yeah, they, we we very well may see him end up joining the club. Well, we'll talk about Finn well, and, a bit and, more and, of it later. I would say at that point, though, you really have to weigh, okay, you know, just upside of your happiness, but your financials. Now, right. if I is, am I going to be able to make more traveling the world? Because New Japan's going to have some different options for me. You know, you could probably still come work some state stuff and all that in Mexico. And that merchandise is is the WWE merchandise. Is that going to outweigh your earned potential there on your own on the independence? I mean, that's that's going to be a, a big decision for for Finn Balor. It would be for anybody. Yeah, that that's for sure. All right, so let's talk about uh, the big match that everybody is talking about. John Moxley has the best match that he has had in five years, at least. Um, this match with Ishii, man, I, I don't even know where to begin. I was not a fan of this match. I know that everybody loved it, and I'm sure that you know why I was not a fan of this match. Yeah, hey, I, you know, I maybe not as high as... as so many others are, but I mean, this was right up my alley. Oh, I understand that. But when you have two grown men sitting on all fours, just freaking headbutting each other over and over and over and over, I was incredibly uncomfortable. Hey, go back and look a little bit. They were a lot of those. They seem like they wasn't like as, as dangerously connecting as you thought, as you would think. It's just even the visual man. Like, do we really need to do that? Is there any need for a spot like that anymore? Well, I and I think that might have been, you know, the point of it. And I think there might have been like some deep, deeper issues in there. I mean, I was kind of, you know, just popping. Uh, it, to me, it was a little bit symbolic of, you know, on one hand, you know, Moxley trying to really get back to those roots, that ultra violent, that style that, that he established himself with. And then I had to chuckle a little bit because it was almost like Moxley for years as Dean Ambrose just beating his head against the wall. That's a really good metaphor, and Tomohiro Ishii is absolutely a freaking wall. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it was during this match that Kevin Kelly let out with a stat that just blew my mind. You know, the, Tomohiro Ishii debuted in, like, 1996, and this guy, like, just in the last, I don't know, what, three, four years has just caught absolute Fire. He is actually the senior statesman of this year's G1 Climax, and you would never know it to look at him. This guy's in tremendous shape. He's going out there and having the best matches of his career. Is Ishii another one of these guys that we need to just enjoy while we got him? Because he doesn't show any sign of slowing down, but this guy's older than AJ Styles. Well, you know, I'll let you in on a little secret here. Uh, you know, I have quite a bit, you know, in my bloodline, uh, you know, that Asian connection. Uh, it's one of those things. And I see it in my family, uh, especially those that, that really kind of lean towards that look. It's very distinctive with them. They age tremendously. I mean, you don't see it at all, but then one day, boom, it's just going to catch up them. to them. And it, it, it happens like they go to bed and wake up and it's like, holy shit, you just aged 10 years. 
Yeah, I, I, I've seen a little bit of gray starting to seep into Ishii's beard, you know, and it's like I didn't think anything of that. But then when you really start thinking about the career that this guy has had and how long he has been doing this, how long he's been beating up his body, I know he doesn't have a neck, but maybe he did when his career actually started. It's just incredible, man, to, to see a man his age going out and having the matches that he's having. It, it's just incredible to me. Absolutely. All right, let's let's go ahead. Let's talk about the matches that I got up at 4.30 in the morning to watch. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr. defeats Bad Luck Fale via countout. Absolutely love that. The petulant child has finally gotten his first win of the G1. Hiroshi Tanahashi defeats Lance Archer in just another fantastic match from Lance Archer. Kenta defeats Evil. Ibushi defeats Sonata. And Okada defeats Osprey. Okada and Osprey basically the same match that we've seen out of them. I believe this is the fourth singles match that these two guys have had. It, it's very much what you would think it was going to be. I don't think anybody necessarily expected Osprey to win this match. Uh, Kenta and Evil, Ibushi and Sonata, those were absolutely my two matches of the morning. Huckleberry, what did you think of this show? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was solid around. Um, I, I think probably it was on the back end of what we've seen so far. Uh, but, you know, to bring us all the way up to speed and all this, I guess one of the big questions after everything that we know now, uh, two big questions for you, Jargo, your, who is the MVP so far and who is maybe your surprise letdown? Well, I mean, as far as MVP goes, it, it sounds insane, but I got to say Lance Archer. Lance Archer is I was gonna, having killer matches Every night, even the undercard tag matches are awesome. I was absolutely going to go with you 100, percent and I know we're going to we're going to we're going to catch it, you know, for we're playing favorites again uh, because he came on the show with you. But you no, know, and we said going into this, this was such a, a proving ground for him. He had an absolute point to make, especially with you know with the delusion with the uh, you know the breakup of Killer Elite, of Killer Elite Squad. You know, for him, you know, it was this was going to be a statement. Where is he going to stand in New Japan Pro Wrestling? He has absolutely come out here and shown that, you know, he is the real deal. Watch out for Lance Archer. You know, he has shined here. Now, uh, who would you say on the on the other end of that? Who's Who's been the letdown? You know, I got to go with Bad Luck Fale. Um, I, I, and I love Bad Luck Fale, but his matches inside the tournament just have not been good. You know, a year ago when we were talking about Fale inside of the G1, there was this this overlying story arc. He he had not been pinned. He had not been submitted. That streak is still alive. Um, it, it's just the match quality inside of the G1 that we're seeing from everybody, even freaking Yano inside of this tournament has been entertaining. Fale matches inside of this tournament, I've just kind of found boring. You know, th this could be part of the story because, you know, remember going into this thing, he, he made that statement, I'm just going to show everyone I can fucking wrestle. So what if, what if at some point, maybe it's within the tournament or after it, he just comes out and says, you know what, fuck that wrestling stuff. <laughs> I'm just going back to fucking hurting people. I mean, and, and the thing is, when you look at the the guys outside of the tournament, like you mean to tell me this tournament wouldn't have been better with Minoru Suzuki instead of Bad Luck Fale? You know, like and you and you can throw in a number of names that you know could have filled that spot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ibushi, I, I also have to toss Sonata out there as well. You, you've been disappointed with Sonata uh, a little bit. The, the matchup with Ibushi from this morning I thought was really, really good. But again, I feel like Ibushi is so limited in what he can do compared to what we're seeing Ibushi do. It's like we're – and I was having this conversation with 8-Track Brown this morning too. And, and this is kind of where the Kenta conversation comes in. I remember watching Kenta matches from when he was in pro wrestling, Noah, when he first got to the WWE and Kenta was known, yeah, for his strikes, but he was also a high flyer inside of this tournament. While Kenta has not lost a match, he's looked great. Everybody's putting him over strong. It's kind of just Kenta going out there and kicking and punching people, right? Like, there's not necessarily that aspect that made Kenta one of the best wrestlers in the world. Like, there's all this hype around him, and we're pushing him to the moon, but he's fallen kind of flat to me. I can see that argument as well. 
and I, I, I kind of feel that way with Ibushi too. Like Ibushi is a trained kickboxer. He's had professional fights as a kickboxer, but that's not what I want to see out of Kota Ibushi. And that's very much the Ibushi that we're getting in this tournament. Thanks to that ankle injury. I can't help but wonder how different this would be. One thing that's driving me nuts with Sonata though, is this damn obsession with the paradise lock. Like, I feel like Sonata should just get rid of the paradise lock altogether. If you really want me to take you seriously, because going out there and doing that move in every freaking match being obsessed with hitting that stupid move, it just, it downgrades Sonata and puts a ceiling on him to me. But maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's, you know, just it's kind of like seeping into my mind where, you know, a little bit of disappointment with him. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's flip things over. Let's talk about AEW. Rick, the biggest story from AEW this week, I, we, we've got Sean Spears to talk about. We've got MJF re-signing a new contract. But people lost their freaking minds. Yeah, CM Punk was announced for StarCast. And immediately I'm seeing the graphic, CM Punk is all elite. no. CM Punk is just going to StarCast. Rick, are people making just way too much out of this, or am I just, like, so over the CM Punk thing? Well, I mean, I think we let's look a little deeper into this thing. He doesn't have to travel. He doesn't have to deal with, it, you know, air flight, booking rooms, checking in and out, you know, where is he going to eat? Uh, I mean, this is just a trip down the road for him. This is this is a, a huge payday for him too. It's a massive payday, and everybody else, you know, they want to, you know, yes, there is that tight connection between these two, but they are still two different entities. And even going last year to All In, I mean, look at the people that flocked over to Pro Wrestling Tees, the line that that formed outside of there. It was like a couple miles long, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like two and a half miles or something like that. Two the and line a half miles. to get into Keep, CC on Punk. It, and people were waiting like five hours for this thing. You know, if you're Conrad and his crew and you're looking for draws, ultimate draws, especially since, you know, this is the second time around, this is your third star cast, your second time in Chicago. You want to, you want to really make this thing lit. You want it to be happening. You want to have that ultimate draw. You're going to put, you're going to pay whatever you possibly can to get CM Punk there. Do you think that CM Punk will be at all out in any kind of a in-ring context? I, I want to say 75% of me says no, but I don't, you, you don't want to say, you know, never say never. Uh, I think if it is, you know, it's going to be something to, and it's going to be another big payday. It's going to be something to really excite really excite that core audience there. Those that are still following what's going on with CM Punk. I, and I've got to, you know, when we're looking at today's casual and we regularly see these conversations, what is AEW doing to pull casual fans? They're, they're relying too much on this core audience. that's going to follow them anywhere. That's buying a t-shirt that is still, you know, every day, you know, up to the hour on the sheet. They're relying too much on them. What are they going to do to pull those casuals? I got a feeling a lot of casuals really have no connection to CM Punk. Not at this yeah, how point. big of a draw is he going to be there? And I know because even during CM Punk's rise, you know, not his, his rise and then his run at the top there, we're still talking about an era that was declining in professional wrestling. That's a very valid you know, this point. Isn't, this isn't like, a, you know, where you can say, okay, uh, a rock's going to be there. Stone Cold's going to make an appearance where, I mean, it was at its all time high. So individuals like me and you can start talking about it or other outlets, you know, you know, news outlets are going to pick up on it. And those old school, those fans that have left are going to come to individuals like us and ask us what's going on. CM Punk isn't going to pull that kind of crowd simply because he's not a knock on CM Punk, just because his sample group, that audience wasn't as large. They weren't as invested then. Yeah, that's a very, very valid point. Um, now I'm going to make the case for CM Punk to join AEW. Um, I don't want to see him in the ring. I, I, I think it's past. I'm over it. I have no desire to see well, I, CM Punk in a ring. But you know what I would like to see him do? I, I would like to see him replace Alex Marvez on commentary. 
That's what I would like to see from CM Punk. I think that's your best route. Uh, and what you can do there is you actually are, then you're, you're building a bridge between some audiences. You've got good old JR. That's for the classics. You know, that I don't care. People can knock him all at once. He is freaking JR. He's earned every right to do everything he can out there. And he is still, you know, he is one of the all time greatest. And even to this day, uh, might be a little step behind, but he's still one of the very best at what he does. And if you can put him in a position with some great surrounding cast members, uh, he's going to shine once again, but especially with someone like CM Punk. And then what I'm talking about, you know, building that bridge there is you've got that old school classic that JR, they're going to be attracted to JR. And then you do have that, you know, why it might not have been as big as like an attitude era, people are going to gravitate gravitate towards CM Punk. And he does have a great personality. He could bring a lot to the table there. He does a great job on the MMA shows that I've heard him doing color for. Correct. I mean, he knows how to deliver. He's got a great sense of humor. Uh, You know, he he pulls you in. He, He gets you invested. And that's what you want there. And then talking about if he ever gets back in the ring, you don't want to throw him right in the ring. I mean, why, why blow your load on that? Start with him on commentary. People loved it. Remember when he did the short stint there when he was going through the injury? Yep. He, people absolutely loved it. So start there. Let him do that for a year. And then maybe a, a, maybe next year when you're in Chicago for the third time and you need another hook, that's when he's going out there and having a match, you know, and it could be, I mean, could you imagine if in 2020 Labor Day weekend in Chicago, we're talking about CM Punk versus Kenny Omega for the AEW and championship. You had that, and, yeah. And you had that build. I mean, that's once again, you're causing people, you're giving them a reason to, to give up everything and flock to the windy city because they can't miss this thing. Yeah, and that would be a really, really freaking hot program. I also think Punk would do a a really nice job of kind of bridging the gap between Excalibur and Jim Ross. I Rick, at this point, and I I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm ready for JR to take not necessarily a step back, but I don't want him to be the voice of AEW anymore. I want him to be a voice, but I want the voice to be Excalibur. Excalibur, I, I feel like every show that they have done, Excalibur has just knocked it out of the park. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, in, in all the praise I just gave to JR, he absolutely ha- has earned that. And everybody, is, you know, that has any respect for this business should recognize that. Uh, but I will agree with you in a sense, especially when they get the TV you know, less is going to be more with Jim Ross. Save him from them big moments. That, does, that doesn't necessarily mean take him off of television because people are going to tune in for him. You know what I'd really like to see on on their television programming, and it, ECW, Paul Heyman was so masterful in this, where he could run like an interview. I remember really one uh, with, with Terry Funk, and it ran in different parts throughout the entire episode, throughout the hour. So it just wasn't like a 15 minute sit down like you would get with WWE or something like that. I mean, it was like, okay, you know, you were on the hook. You wanted to wait to that next interview segment, you know, in between matches or whatever, to see what he had to say, especially when you need to introduce this new talent. I would love to see some, you know, some featured sit sit downs with JR on their television programming, where maybe, maybe, you know, it's just 30 second bits at a time where it's a one question and then cut to a commercial and then come back to the second, you know, another question later to really get you invested, to get you to understand who some of these new characters are, you know, even in, you know, people that kind of think that they're, they're in the know, you know, they're very passionate about professional wrestling in the circles we run in, but so many of them will regularly say, I don't know. I don't recognize who half of this roster is. I don't know anything about them. I think what I would do is I would make Jim Ross, basically the narrator. I would have Excalibur be the play by play. And I would have punk on color. So basically everything leading up to the match, everything between the matches, anything that's going to be a big storyline point, that's going to be Jim Ross's department. The actual calling of the wrestling moves inside of the ring, that's what Excalibur is going to do. And Punk, you just kind of bridge the gap. Just just add the color to the picture that these two guys are drawing. And I think it would be absolutely freaking fantastic. I could get behind that because you're absolutely, you know, when, when I'm doing my play by play and I've talked to you about this and uh, best of luck, I haven't heard. Hopefully, hopefully he got the spot. I know MSG was doing a voiceover for a local promotion, calling a couple matches out there uh, in the Northwest here in the States. 
And, and I was telling him, he said, you know, there's different approaches to this thing. You know, there, there's play-by-play guys. You got your, your villains there, your, your antagonists. You know, but when I approach it is I'm the storyteller. It's, it's my job to tell, you know, I tell the backgrounds, you know, I'm telling you where they're from, what they've been through, why you should invest in them. I'm talking about what's going on in the, in the promotion, just trying to put a spotlight on what's happening in that ring. In my mind, especially in independent wrestling and all that, and, and a lot, and, you know, more so what's happening with AEW, the fans that are watching this, they know the name of the moves. They know what's going on, but they, they might not, you know, exactly know about the talent. And to me, overall, in professional wrestling, it's character and storyline, and that's what I try to do. And that's where, you know, Jim Ross could come in, and then you use that, that legendary voice and that emotion. You know, when he does pop in over Excalibur, it's for those big spots, those big moments. You know, uh, a, a big finisher is hit, uh, an, an upset, a new champion or crowning a champion. That's where he is going to, to lend his expertise to this team. Or the other approach that you can take is the WWE approach, where Mitchell Cole does basically everything, and then you have two other people to sit there and argue back and forth and make your commentary just absolutely unlistenable. Um, one of the things that you brought up is is the sit-down interviews that Jim Ross is is so capable of doing and just absolutely knocks it out of the park. We saw one on the Road to All Out Episode 1. We saw Sean Spears finally sit down with good old JR and explain to everybody everything I've been telling them for the last however many weeks. Um but then we saw the return of a horseman, Huckleberry Tully Blanchard, seemingly has signed a multi-show deal with All Elite Wrestling, and he is going to be in the corner of one Mr. Sean Spears, because if anybody knows how to take down a Rhodes, it's a horseman. I absolutely love this angle here. Uh, perfect. You know, If you're going to go after that family, I mean, who better to turn to than, than the group that was, you know, the rival and regularly bettered the American dream. So now the big question is, who will Cody put in his corner? Is this where we see Arn Anderson make a return? Or are we going back to somewhat, someone else that's going to be close to the Rhodes family? Wow, you know... Uh... Such, such a great question. There's so many different directions you could actually get here. Oh man, they're, they're, uh, I think th- this is this is w- when you watch the first Shrek movie and Shrek's talking about you know ogres and how they're like onions and there's layers and layers that you can just peel back immediately. Just involving Tully Blanchard in this thing, just layers upon layers upon layers. And, and you know, I mean, if you are Cody, I mean, would you trust another horseman? How could a Rhodes ever trust a horseman? You know, who else would there be? But who else knows Tully and the way his brain works better than the enforcer? I understand that, but, you know, hey, for the horseman, you know, ride or die, uh, the, the four stay alive. That, you know, would you trust that, you know, even this isn't some kind of ploy to, to ultimately get over on the Rhodes? And maybe that Sean is going to be dubbed with this new opportunity to create a, a new horseman like faction within AEW. As we're already we're already seeing so many uh, comparisons and parallels to WCW. I mean, is this something that they could capture? And I know the speculation is going to be out there. Is there a way to work around a contract? I mean, could 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 Cody get Tessa in his corner? Well, it, and Tessa is absolutely part of this i mean make no mistake of course tessa w- would want to work you know at the same company where her father is working like th- th- this is recruiting as much as it is incredible storyline um y- you bring up the the idea of a new set of horsemen and i absolutely freaking love that idea I have three of the four. I'm not sure who I would make the fourth horseman. My, my, my three horsemen right at the moment are Sean Spears, MJF, and the artist formerly known as Jungle Boy when that time comes. I, I absolutely would include him inside of this group. Uh, I, I don't know about Jungle Boy. I know you're really big on that. I'm uh, telling you, man, that, the, that, the that, crowd that. connects with that kid for one reason or another. 
I, I know, man. I know you're really big on, you know, that, that feral kid coming into society and being taken in by the aristocrat and, and totally transformed. I just Corrupted. think when you, when you get him, when I think about something about the four horsemen and the prestige of that, uh, I think he at least got to be over five foot five and weigh over 110 pounds. <laughs> Tremendous. Okay. So are, are you with me on MJF though? Uh, I could see that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, man, uh, as much as a, a tremendous fit as I believe that would be, that MJF could eventually maybe slide into that flare role. I, I don't know if I would want this group to exactly mirror the Horsemen or even use actually the name. I, I think I would just want them to be Horseman esque in a way. I don't think they could use the uh, name because I'm sure WWE owns that trademark at this point. I, there's got to be you know ways around that even that really hints to I mean you got like the horse women in MMA I mean there's got there's got to be something in there with that but they they likely do because they're already they they sell horseman t-shirts right yeah I'm sure they own that trade um, and they still have flair in the freaking company so right you know they still got him there but uh Man, as I'm thinking here, you know, I'm even thinking, you know, one of the names that just popped out to me for a group like this, it, you know, obviously you start with Spears, uh, but it's, that, it's someone that, I, that needs something drastic at this point. And he's already the main event picture is Hangman, Adam Page. Ooh, yeah, I could get behind that, too. That's something I think we're going to have to revisit. It, as I think about it, I could really get behind that. But let's, let's throw that out there. Let's have some people talk about it here over the next couple of days. And maybe we revisit this in the locker room or something like that. Who's your AEW four horsemen? Uh, we, we talked a little bit about MJF. Rick, people are so, so stupid. Um, it, and in fact, as 8-Track Brown would say, you fucking marks. Jesus Christ. Did you see this video MJF signing a new deal? I did. And people thought that was real. Hey, this goes down to, man. AEW is the master of this. You know, people get on him for, you know, breaking the kayfabe and some of the back backstage shenanigans, post-show and all that. But when it comes down to it, when they're absolutely out here working, people, they are absolutely out there working the mark cards. I, I could not believe that people thought that was real. You know what that was? That was AEW trolling WWE for trying to extend everybody's contract. That's exactly what I took from that. Oh, yeah, exactly. Just, just poking the bear a little bit more, having fun. Fucking marks. All right, let's talk some Ring of Honor. Uh, Huckleberry, in just a matter of a couple of hours, we've got Manhattan Mayhem going down tonight. Uh, we're going to see the ROH World Championship on the line. Matt Taven versus Jay Lethal. I didn't even know this match was happening until like a week ago. The, the promotion for yeah. this has been awful. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, obviously you got the greatest Ring of Honor champion, a, a face of, of the company. And Jay Lethal. Long running and Jay Lethal and arguably, you know, the, the the number one defending champion in the in the world in Matt Taven, who's an absolute workhorse. Uh, you, you got that kind of built in here. But outside of this, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of interaction between these two. And Jay Lethal has been very cooled off for, uh, what, a better part of a year or at least a year in 2019. When's the last time Jay Lethal won a match? Of significance, I can't tell you. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while. I mean, hell, Kenny King basically swept him three to nothing in a best of three series. Like, that's not even supposed to be humanly possible. And, and I'm expecting King to kind of get involved here. So it, it kind of it, it drastically lowers my excitement level for it. I'm also expecting Alex Shelley to be involved in this as well. Maybe maybe that's the great neutralizer, and Teddy Long's going to come out and make it a tag team match, player. There we go. Is this an Honor Club event tonight? Um, well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about, because it seems as though ROH is changing the way that they're doing TV tapings now. They're going to show the big matches on Honor Club, even if it is a TV taping, so that we don't like you know have a championship switch hands, and then we don't see it on TV for four weeks. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know uh, Mr. Kennedy. Seth Kennedy brought that to our attention. Uh, and this is something we've been kind of, we've been talking about for a long time. Yep. Is how confusing it is that there's like two different like honor verses going on here. There's television and then there's honor club. Yeah. And they don't they, they don't coincide. You're not really sure what's going on at some point. I and mean, you might run something on honor club and 
in storyline wise, it, it didn't unfold until two weeks later in television. Yeah, it, it makes the you have to follow one of the universes, and and that's it. Otherwise, it's just completely and utterly confusing. At least ROH is trying to rectify that issue. Now, I, I do, I do like how they're mixing up. I do wonder though if they're going to do because last time they did this when they aired the the Briscoes and uh, God. Uh, that was a highlights thing, and you know that was you know tuned in for this match. But they did, they were running, and they would cut in and out on a television taping, and you got to see the backstage production. You, you got to hear Mr. Riccaboni talking to the producers, and then getting you know in his ear like, "Give us a retake on on this transition," or he would even be telling Colt, "Okay, uh, on these intros, we just came back from an interview with Jeff Cobb, so mention that as Kenny King's making his way to the ring." Right. That itself, outside of the wrestling, I, you know how big I was on it. it. It was pretty exciting to see something like that or, you know, to be able to hear it. All of us production nerds absolutely love that stuff. Uh, also on this show, we have Dragon Lee taking on Jonathan Gresham, which I'm sure will be absolutely fantastic. Lifeblood and PJ Black take on Villain Enterprises. Of course, uh, after being betrayed by Flip Gordon, Lifeblood's looking for revenge. And then we have the big match of the night, the, the big selling point. Yeah, it's not Matt Taven versus Jay Lethal for the ROH World Heavyweight Championship. It's the ROH Tag Team Championships on the line. Finally, yeah, our boys, G.O.D., taking on your boys, them boys, the Briscoes. This thing's going to be violent. I'm looking forward to it, and I absolutely expect the Briscoes to take these championships tonight. Uh, I, I think this is a switch back. we, we got to get them in a regular rotation, get the, get the championships back on American soil within an American promotion or North American promotion. Uh, I think this is this is one of the matches you know of the month that I am looking forward to right here, and, and we we've, we've got a little glimpse of it before. We got that sneak peek, you know. They, they just they chubbed you up a little bit, but now it's that second date. You know, she's ready to put out. Talking about uh, chubbing up a little bit, Jay Briscoe picked up the phone the other day. Rick, did you see this video? Nick Aldis talking uh, some I, shit about Jay Briscoe, and he's like, all you got to do is pick up the phone, Jay. And Jay's like, wait, I got to do what? I got to pick up the phone? Okay, I'll pick up the phone. Oh, man, it's going down for the 10 pounds of gold. It's going to be Nick Aldis versus Jay Briscoe. I don't care where it is. I'm watching this match. One way or another, I will see this match. Hey, I regularly say in, in today's age, if you ask me 10 matches I want to see, eight of them involve a Briscoe or both of them together. Insufficient funds. Wrote a check your ass can't cash. Insufficient funds. Fucking great promo from Jay Briscoe. Absolutely love that. Can't wait to see that. And then we have Mass Hysteria, Huckleberry. This one's going down tomorrow. We'll recap both of these shows inside of the locker room, hackerhameen.podbean.com on Monday. ROH TV Championship on the line as Eli Isom steps up to the plate to get knocked the fuck out by Shane Taylor. Roosh is going to take on Dalton Castle again. Yeah, looking forward to that. Hopefully that match goes about 14 seconds. Kenny King takes on Dragon Lee. I'm not looking forward to that match because they're going to put Kenny King over and it's just going to piss me off. ROH six-man tag team championships on the line. Lifeblood versus Villain Enterprises. We're, we're continuing this Flip Gordon feud. Then we got PJ Black versus Silas Young. And in your main event, it's going to be the entire kingdom, all three of them, taking on Alex Shelley, Jonathan Gresham, and Jay Lethal. Rick, Mass Hysteria strikes me as a very interesting show, just kind of the way that they, they've built this thing and how it's been advertised. Alex Shelley, Jonathan Gresham, and Jay Lethal all working together with with whatever is going on with Jonathan Gresham. That could be a very, very interesting trio. Uh, yeah, Gresham, kind of at that breaking point. You know, it's, it's, he's turning that corner, maybe, be, you know, I don't know if it's frustration or he, he's maybe growing a little bit. He's just hungrier and realizing that he needs to put it out there more on the line, but he's going to be something you know, it, it's, it, what's very interesting here is you name all those other names. You, know, you got the champ, you've got, you know, his guys in the kingdom, you got the challengers there. You got Jay Lethal from the night before you got Alex Shelley, who's made his intentions clear to go after Taven or whoever the champion is. 
But then you got Gresham, and he's kind of on the outside. And right now, as I said, he's hungry. What kind of hunger is that? How will you know? How far is he willing to go to get his get himself kind of represented in in that big picture? Trio's titles on the line. Is this where Villain Enterprises drops the titles, and we say goodbye to Marty? I don't see it at this at this point. Um, I, I still think they're going to write it out here with Marty. We haven't heard any rumblings yet with him going anywhere exactly, right? No, I haven't heard anything. Uh, so I, I think we write it out a little bit more. I still think there's more story to be told here. I, so I think, you know, the, the real story is not about so much lifeblood at this You know, the big story isn't going to be about Flip versus lifeblood. We need to get through that and evolve more in towards Marty and Flip and their turmoil before we see the departure of Marty. What about the the real Lucha Bros? We've got Roosh and Dragon Lee both on this card. Roosh taking on Dalton Castle to continue that feud. Kenny King taking on Dragon Lee. They both sound like good matches on paper. Well, again, you know, Kenny King, just that disconnect with him. You, You feel the same way as I do. We talk about this regularly, and they're still hot on him. They're still high on him. You know, essentially, he sweeps Jay Lethal. You got to believe, you know, he's just going to go over on Dragon Lee. And I'm not even really kind of assuming the outcome makes me less excited. And I'm not even really looking forward to, you know, seeing the the interaction between the two at this point. Uh, But on the flip of that, though, you're talking Roosh and Castle. You said do it in 14 seconds. I would love to see a series of these where it almost gets down and not just where it's 14, 13, where it's a countdown. That's going to be overkill, but go to 14. Then in the next match, have Roosh do it in like 10. And then having beat him again in like six. And then get it down to where it's like three or something like that. And then put some kind of gimmick on the thing. It has to be at least three. That's what I'm saying. Like Roosh hits him before the bell and then, oh, okay, gotcha. ring it. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, let's, and then and then at some breaking point, you know, come up with some kind of crazy gimmick to put on this thing. <laughs> Love it. Uh, let's talk about Impact Wrestling a little bit. They're they're doing something here, Rick, and I, I don't even know. Um, so they did this mashup tournament, and what they did is they took a bunch of enemies and they put them together as tag teams, and then they had a tournament, and whoever won the series of matches would then all kind of face off against one another. And whoever won that match, the two tag team partners are now going to have to wrestle for a shot at Brian Cage and the Impact Championship. So the way they laid this thing out, it was Eddie Edwards and Moose defeating Cody Diener and Raju. They had Jake Crist and Zachary Wentz taking on Madman Fulton and Rich Swan. Michael Elgin and Willie Mack defeat Ace Austin and Stone Rockwell. Sammy and Tessa together as a tag team take on Dave Crist and Trey Miguel. That match was interesting. Then we had Jessica Havoc all by herself defeat Madison Rain and Taya Valkyrie. So then we have this big scramble match, and Sammy and Tessa defeat everyone. Yeah, yeah, Tessa's going to join OVE now. But it's a short-lived join because we're going to get Sammy and Tessa 2. It's happening on August 2nd at Impact Unbreakable. Rick, this is in like two weeks. We're going to get Sammy versus Tessa 2, and the winner gets a shot at Brian Cage. This feels so forecasted to me with Sammy beating Tessa the first time. The name of the show is Unbreakable. Tessa's going to go over here, and it's going to be Tessa Blanchard taking on Brian Cage at Bound for Glory. That doesn't do it for me. Yeah, I was thinking about this. Uh, Overall, you know, one of the teams that really intrigued me there, I want to give a shout out, especially here as I'm sitting in Ohio. I love the the combination of uh, Dave Crist and... And Who was he with? I'm sorry, shit. Trey and Trey Rascals. and Trey. Well, I mean, yeah, because Trey, you know, has given Dave so much credit for his development in pro wrestling. Right. You know, both based here out of you know the Buckeye State. It was great to see those guys together. I wish they would have picked up the victory there. Overall, this this little gimmick thing here, I loved it. Well, you know, one of my favorite things going back to my childhood, I loved the Lethal Lottery. Absolutely loved that pay per view with with WCW. And before they kind of started confusing it, overbooking it, was hey, you know, it was. All right, we're, we're that this night. You don't know who it's going to be. We're going to randomly call them out at a time. We're going to we're going to pair people up. Could, they could be foes. They could be friends. They could have history. Whatever. We're going to have tag matches. The winning tag, the winning 
the winning team inside of a match, they're going to advance to, what was it, the Battle Bowl. Yep. And that was an over-the-top uh, Battle Royal, and then the winner there was going to advance for a championship opportunity. This is just a twist on it, on that. Uh, I love what they did here. I thought this was very interesting. Something that, you know, kind of shakes up a little bit. And we hear that term so often in inside pro wrestling. This actually was a little bit of a change. Uh, and I took it even more as, you know what, kind of a middle finger to the mixed match challenge. You know, we're going to shake some things up. We're going to do some different tag teams. We're going to do it properly, though. We're going to mix our guys and girls together, but we're not going to have these stupid boundaries with these rules that don't even apply to half the competitors. But uh, so we do have our finals. You, you got Tessa, you got Sammy. And I, I, what I don't like is the thought of Tessa getting that win back so quickly. Yeah. I think there is, there's more money in a long term story with her losing once again to, to Sammy and really, sh- and, and maybe kind of defining, you know what, there is a difference there uh, when it comes to the men and the women of Impact. And, and and as Tessa now is emerged as one of the top names, just not impact is as a knockout, but in all of women's professional wrestling and all professional wrestling, she's one of those top names, but show that, you know, there is that little bit of that, that distinction, that difference where it's going to be a little tougher for her to overcome that mountain. I think there's bigger money in the long term than in the short term. Of course, though, if you're impact wrestling and maybe internally, you know, you don't have that long with her that you need to go ahead and get this done. I just don't like it. I don't like the matchup. Uh, Sammy versus Tessa. Okay, yeah. I can suspend my disbelief far enough that Tessa Blanchard is going to take out Sammy Callahan. No problem. Tessa Blanchard versus Brian Cage? Eh? Rick, can you can you get behind that match? I just I, I don't know if I can suspend my disbelief that far. Well, what we just saw at uh, Barroom Wrestling, Brian Cage and Tessa a lap dance inside the ring. You know what? That's I'm I'm happy that you brought that up because we saw that come out, and we also saw the Braun Strowman karaoke thing, and, and people are just ripping on these guys. You know who you need to be ripping on? The fucking YouTubers busting out your goddamn phones and just putting up all kinds of trash content that's just going to destroy the narrative. But, you know, hey, you got 75,000 fucking YouTube views. Congratulations. You didn't make a fucking dime because YouTube demonetized all that shit. All you're doing is ruining it for everybody else. You want to enjoy that shit on a Friday night in a fucking bar full of 200 people? More fucking power to you. The entire goddamn globe doesn't need to see it. Put your fucking phones away. You know, and it, a couple things on this, and I know you know the traditionalists in it. You know, and, and Ben, if you know social media police, he'd be throwing lines out everywhere. I mean, this this isn't the it's the fault of the talent that, that somebody you know just, and not even a sense of wrestling, just a, a general in life Mark Tard is going to pull it. I mean. I never really got, I never got that gimmick to feel the need to pull out your phone and try to put up something that's ultimately embarrassing to someone that, that is, isn't deserving of it. Yeah, you claim that you love Brian Cage and you'll support him to the death, but now, you know, let me do everything I can to ruin his fucking career. You know, but, just... you know inside of that, and I, you know, they were they having this conversation over in the, the PW Hustle discussion group on Facebook, uh, you know, Professor AOC over there immediately. Anything that he can make a comparison to boo-hoo, people busting on on WWE, why don't you do it to everybody else? It's okay to make different comparisons and hold, hold promotions to different standards because they are different. They're presenting different products. That's what barroom wrestling is. They're a different show like that. They're going to give you those crazy antics. They are, you know, that's what they, they're the run of the mill typical indie show. They're not trying to present themselves as anything else. They're not wholesome family entertainment. And it's intended for the live audience, not a global audience. Otherwise, they'd be running it on USA fucking network. It, that's, that's 100% correct there. And as you're in there, too, and, and yes, and in the case of, of Brian Cage and, and Braun Strowman, yes, they are supposed to be these dominating monsters, these beasts. And, and, you know, I used to get on this myself. This is one of those things where I, I'm starting to come along, I guess. And, and really, it goes back to a guest that we had on the show and a great explanation that she gave is one with Kelly Klein. It was talk about managing 
your social media and, and your real persona and your wrestling persona and how she laid it out there at times. Why can't it be both? Uh, as I, as I see Braun, you know, I, I don't exactly agree with like WWE.com running the elf thing out there because it really hurts themselves by their narrative. But to actually believe that everyone out there is that big of like a killer monster, they don't have any kind of heart, especially when Braun is presented as a baby face. You got somewhere in there, the guy likes to have fun, but when it comes down to business, he can turn it on. Same thing with Brian Cage. Like to me, to me, that's the line though, Rick. I mean, if, if if WWE had posted this video of Braun Strowman out doing fucking karaoke, I would have a huge issue with it. But the fact that it was just some freaking moron in a bar just recording Braun Strowman singing karaoke and then posted up to all of his social media pages, that I do have an issue with. Yeah, I, that's, I, I'm with you 100% there. You know, if it's the company damaging their themselves, then yes, then fans have a right to, you know, to outrage and speak up about it. But if it's just some fucking Mark Tart out there with his, with his iPhone taking video, thinking that he's some kind of, you know, Dave Meltzer insider giving everyone this big, scoop, then no, that guy can go fuck himself. Yep. And, and that's exactly what I've took both of those instances to be. God damn people. Can't have a little bit of fun. You gotta gotta ruin it for everybody. Let's uh let's throw things over to NXT. Huckleberry talking about fun. We're just a couple of weeks away from Takeover Toronto. We've got the the big main event has been announced, and now we're gonna see a new NXT talent making their way to 205 Live. We, we we saw a main roster talent make his way back to NXT. Crazy week inside of the world of NXT. Number one, we saw Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle comes out. He wins himself his match, and then he gets attacked by Killian Dane, formerly of Sanity. Um, I'm a little surprised they didn't send Killian Dane over to the UK, but they must still be high enough on the guy that they're keeping him at NXT North America. I look forward to this matchup, but... I'm not sure that Matt Riddle shouldn't just absolutely murder Killian Dane at this point. I actually think that's what I think this is what this is set up for. Uh, we need some behemoth. We need some over the top brute to, to play this role for us here. Who do we got? Is there anyone available? And they're probably running through their list. They're, they're looking through the roster. You know, the pages of pages of people that they employ. Boom, who's sitting at home doing nothing for us? We're not really that guy. All we've soured on him and it's Killian Dane. Call him up. He's under contract. He's got to do this stuff. Get his ass down here. We're going to do a short program with Riddle. Just to, And if anything, who's Riddle been running his mouth about? Brock Lesnar, right? Right. And it's starting to pick up a little steam. You're going to have to start sharing Riddle going over these, these guys that are just towering over him. These just behemoths, if you will. And this is a great starting point. Well, I mostly agree with with everything that you just said. The only thing is they've been running vignettes for Killian Dane for weeks now. Like, it seemed like they were going to bring Killian Dane back and make him a big deal. He was going to be a player in NXT. Like, I don't normally see them run vignettes for six weeks before somebody comes out and attacks Matt Riddle. You know, like... I think, I think that's the genius of it is you build him up into everyone's mind. Like, okay, they're going to repackage here. This is, you know, sanity fell apart. They didn't know what to do there, but they know they have something special here with this big man. He's so athletic, you know, all the power and all this, let's really reestablish him and then feed him the riddle. That very well could be also on this week's show. I mean, think about, you think, I mean, really, this is, that's kind of the formula back in the day, you know, how they were, you know, when you're looking at opponents for Hulk Hogan, a undertaker. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, it, it, you bring in these guys from, you know, you go out and find Andre. them somewhere else, you know, through the territories. Oh yeah. I mean, even with Andre, you know, bring him in, you sell him as uh, always undefeated, never body slam. Now, you know, it is now we have more of history at our disposal. We know that's not true. Uh, you, you, Andre was great. And I was thinking like earthquake, uh, you know, with undertaker, when you bring in giant Gonzalez, I mean, you bring in these people, you set them up where they look so impressive, Un, you know, unbeatable, and then boom, put your guy over. Could you imagine Andre the Giant in the era of social media? Like we're we're talking about Braun Strowman out singing karaoke, you know? God. Oh, I mean, I mean, you had you would have people everywhere following him with with their phones and cameras and capturing everything that he is doing. He would be just absolutely miserable. Uh, Kushida took on Apollo Crews on this show. Speaking of people that are absolutely miserable, Kushida getting the win over Apollo Crews. Good matchup, 
but it, it didn't do anything for Apollo Crews, and I'm not really sure that it did anything for Kushida, you know? It, it, Kushida just kind of feels flat to me. They haven't told you why to care about Kushida at all. Yeah, it's one of those things where they're just hoping that you run him out there, uh, that people, you know, they were already confused by his gimmick and his backstory, and then they're just hoping that his athleticism is going to get him over, and that's a, that's a running problem within WWE. Uh, from top to bottom, you see them doing this, from you know, just breaking in to NXT B shows on through to anywhere. They just assume you're going to know everything about everybody and gravitate towards athletic ability, and that's that professional wrestling. Yeah, I agree. Next week on 205 Live, we're going to see Drew Gulak, uh, the Cruiserweight champion. Of course, he took on Matt Riddle at the Evolve 10th Anniversary Show. He's going to get him hands on another NXT talent as Huckleberry Swerve, Isaiah Scott, formerly known as Shane Strickland, going to make his quote-unquote middle roster debut. You can't even call it the main roster debut anymore. Uh, not when it's on 205 Live, but they're sending Shane Strickland straight to 205 Live. Is this good or is this bad? Or is this just a throwaway match for next Tuesday? I don't know. I, I think we, uh, I, you know, really, if you're looking at, you know, throwing him right in there against the champ, uh, this, is, this is creating interest. Uh, probably a lot more interest than we've seen in, in recent months from 205. It's, you know, those people that are, are following it or, you know, maybe not watching it, but do keep an eye on it. They know, they know the swerve. They're, they're, prob- they're likely going to be tuned into this thing. I don't expect him to win here. I think that we're going to get a great showing. And throwing him right into 205 Live, I, I think that's a tremendous move. They, they need to be brave enough to do that more often with some of these individuals if they want to bolster that brand. Yeah, that's very true. Then we had the announcement of the main event for TakeOver Toronto. It's going to be Adam Cole defending the NXT Championship again against Johnny Gargano. I'm not sure why Johnny Gargano deserves another championship match, but hey, he's going to get one. And it's going to be three stages of hell. Yeah, three stages of hell. When's the last time you heard that phrase used, Rick? Uh, last weekend. <laughs> what was her name? <laughs> oh, man. Geez. Oh, I was just thinking uh, it was, no, they, they lined up uh, a shot of Yukon Jack, a shot of Wild Turkey, uh, then a shot of Jack Daniels behind it. So. <laughs> there you go. That's three stages of hell for sure. Uh, so here's the way this thing's going to work. Adam Cole gets to pick the first match stipulation. Johnny Gargano gets to pick the second match stipulation. And if it would make it to a third fall... General Manager William Regal is going to make the call on the third stipulation. Rick, do you like this? Do, do we really need to see this matchup again? Well, you know, everyone was expecting you know this third match, and I said we're going to get it sooner than later. Uh, I guess to try to keep some interest in it, let's slap a gimmick on it. Uh, you know what I'd really love to see here? Just have Cole win it in the first two stages. I'd be fine with that. Because I don't know where Johnny Gargano goes from here. I mean, like, number one, I have no desire to see Johnny Gargano re-win the NXT championship. And if he loses, then what? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the interesting thing here. I don't think he's going over. I don't think he's getting the victory. It's just, I think that you get to a certain situation at times where you're just in a corner. No matter where you turn, you know, you're at that dead end, if you will. And it, it might be time for a break or, I mean, just a drastic change. I mean, you know what? I'd like to see him maybe become like a, you know, go back to that crazy thing uh, and just become like like a Phantom of the Opera sort of deal. Turn him into the new Sting? Have him hanging out in the rafters up at Full Sail? I, I don't know. Like, I don't want to get like full on Sting because you know, Sting had that, that, that different plot where he was, you know, trying to figure out if people trusted him. He felt betrayed, but he still was and his heart wanted to save his company. I just feel like totally creepy. Uh, and not the rafters, man. I, w- I want him down in like the dungeons and the, and the up out of dumpsters and shit like that. Kind of feel like that's where his career is right now is kind of hanging out by the dumpster. I, I just, I don't know. E- either that or either that or just let him come up and spend a couple of months on the lake. Uh, let people miss him a little bit and then run him back out there. I think that's the best thing that you possibly could do for Johnny Gargano is have him go home for three, four months. You know, maybe hey, bring I'm him back sit- for I'm more games. Here. 
I am sitting here at uh, on Lake Erie right now, looking out at it at the Cantina Bar, and there's a stool open right next to me for Johnny Wrestling. Come on up, dude. The first mudslide or electric lemonade is on me, sir. Johnny mudslide. All right, so let's we talk. Can, we can flick off Canada together. There you go. Let's talk a little bit about WWE, and uh, we got to start with Seth Rollins being a fucking idiot. Um, Rick, this is becoming a thread. It seems like just about every other week now we have Seth Rollins saying something fucking stupid. Uh, this week, Hold on. did you see? Did you see the meme going around here? We've got uh, we've got Becky, we've got uh, Macho, Macho Man. the Man, and uh, Elizabeth. Seth. <laughs> Just tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Um, so Seth Rollins comes out and he says that he thinks that the reason that that people are not, you know, fully on board and in love with Seth Rollins right now is because we're jealous of him because he's dating Becky Lynch. Really, that's that's what you think the problem is. You know, it's it's not the fact that you had like a three month long feud with Baron fucking Corbin, and it, the only reason you were champion of the universe is because you punched Brock Lesnar in the dick. Like that has nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. You know, you opening your mouth and running it about Will Osprey and wanting to compare bank accounts. Nothing to do with it. We're just jealous of you because you're dating Becky Lynch. Seth Rollins is a fucking idiot. Uh, you know, he, he is absolutely, you know, when you, when you look at what Tyler Vilek stood for and, and represented in, in a passion and, and rising through the ranks of professional wrestling, what we've seen evolve here from Seth Rollins and, and believe me, if this is some kind of work, if this, if he is, if the architect is actually blueprinting this thing, then, then bravo, because it's working, uh, because you are totally coming off like as one of uh, the biggest freaking tools in, in all of professional wrestling. It's what you're going for. It, that's the target. You have hit it, my friend. Uh, side of that, you're complete. If, if not, and, and you think this is actually a way to somehow uh, manipulate or, you know, kind of mind trick people into actually getting behind you, completely missing it here. Totally missing the mark. All right, so let's talk about the only thing from WWE TV that was interesting enough to talk about this week, and that's Bray Wyatt. Um, so we saw the Bray Wyatt Finn Balor thing. We talked about Finn earlier on in the show. Uh, Rick, number one, what do you think of the fiend, the lights on, lights off gimmick? I mean, it, it looked pretty cool. Uh, yeah, ultimately, I, I enjoyed it here. This entire thing, going back, going back to Raw, this entire segment was a little confusing to me, more so. And I guess it helped a little bit more that that we saw that we now know that Finn has asked for a little time off. Uh, I thought it was immediately going to end there. You know, at that point, you know, you have the fiend kind of take out Finn, and then possibly months down the road, after you get this thing established, you know, maybe a WrestleMania program, you go back and revisit this this dual personalities of a Bray versus the dual personalities of Finn Balor. Now we're getting rumored they're going to do this at SummerSlam on such a short notice. I mean, uh, again, you know, six months of booking in six minutes. Uh, even outside of this, you know, even the match before to have Joe go over Finn in like 90 seconds, even immediately right there, I get this bad taste in my mouth. Like, okay, so now I'm supposed to care about Joe again. Uh, he just lost, you know, the night before. I, I don't really care about this. Well, he lost and the again, U.S. title, so he gets a shot at the world title. And then after he lost his shot at the world title, then he goes out and he pins the Intercontinental, or I'm sorry, former Intercontinental champion in 90 seconds. So now I can only assume that Joe is in line for a shot at Shinsuke Nakamura. Uh, it's, I, I don't know what they got going on, because then on SmackDown, you know, he comes out again and he tries to insert himself into a match with Kofi. Yeah, it's, and then ends up into that into that six man there. But you know, even that, I mean, just I just want to touch base on that real quick. But you know that that already. So I got the sour taste in my mouth, and then we see Finn go down there. I hope they just don't rush this thing and, and over the overkill here on Finn. As we were talking earlier, though, to me, if you're going to go that route and you're coming at me with contract negotiations and you're trying to lay things out and you're giving me this garbage creative. What faith do, do I really have going forward there? So, you know, my reply there is, I, I, you need to show me the money. Like, you want to talk about dated references? We always get to WWE. I'll drop one for you there. Show me the money. That's all you can actually go with, go to them with. Because what are they going to do, you know, creative-wise to, to feed that, you know, that was inside of you? 
I know number one, it says a job, you know, financials are what's most important, but you're going to want to maximize that if they're going to give you the absolute bottom barrel uh, of the creative side. Rushing this to do it at SummerSlam just seems like an awful, awful idea to me. Um, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I feel like this should be a WrestleMania program, but doing this on basically two weeks of build and this week's episode of raw is basically going to be wipe your ass and flush with it. That that nothing's going to get done as far as SummerSlam this week on raw. Well, well with, with the rumors that we've heard, Finn's going to be off the next two weeks. So that means he comes back the go home show and you set this match up. It was the investment here with two intriguing, with two truly intriguing characters, especially I'll make this confess here. You know, did you see the release? They look really cool. They're going to do the crossover WWE superstars and the Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. So they, they look great. But you know what really jumped out at me? Look who they've chosen. It's Shawn Michaels. It's The Rock. It's John Cena, Stone Cold, and Undertaker. It's further proof that they have no characters and no true stars on today's current roster. The ones that are supposed to be carrying your brand and selling tickets to live events. No one's interested in them. You look at the number, you know, look at some of the top selling t-shirts, the individuals, not overall merchandise because they're not flooding the, flooding their market with it. It's the old school. It's, it's the 316. It's the DX. It's the NWL. It's because of the complete failure by this company to, to build any true standout mega stars. I mean, they have very few right now. And especially when it comes to the day-to-day operation, those that are selling and moving tickets or trying to move tickets day in and day out. And that's, it's, it's, it's a purposeful intent of the company because they do not want anyone to be bigger than that brand. And ultimately they are suffering because of it. And you ain't going to make a new star in two freaking weeks with one segment worth of television. It's it's just not going to happen. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about this week's episode of Raw, and I'm just dreading this. I know there's a lot of people excited about this, but I am just dreading this. Here's the list of talent that is advertised. Alicia Fox, didn't even know that she had left the company. The Boogeyman, Booker T, Christian, Diesel, not Kevin Nash, Diesel, Devon, Eric Bischoff, Eve Torres, Gerald Briscoe, The Godfather, Hulk fucking Hogan, The Hurricane, Jerry Lawler, Jillian Hall, Jimmy Hart, Jonathan Coachman, Kelly Kelly, Kurt Angle, Lillian Garcia, Medusa, Mark Henry, Molina, Mick Foley, Pat Patterson, Razor Ramon, not Scott Hall, Ric Flair, Rikishi, Road Dog, Ron Simmons, not Farouk, no consistency there. Santino Morella, Sergeant Slaughter, Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin, Psycho Sid, Ted DiBiase, and X Pac. Rick, nothing's going to get done on this week's show. They're trying to pop a rating because the fucking financial conference call is next Thursday. And they know there's going to be a lot of questions from investors. They're going to want to know why the ratings are in the toilet. They're going to want to know why revenue is down. So let's try to blow our load two fucking weeks before SummerSlam and do nothing but bury the current talent by bringing back all this old fucking talent when they actually created stars. This is awful. This right. is a terrible Look, fucking idea. Two points here, and one jumped out at me as you were reading up this there. Uh, I am happy to hear that Diesel and Razor Ramon are coming back instead of Kevin, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, mainly because it screams to me we're not going to get uh, the over Ignatius shoved down our throat NWO and club fucking segment. So then it shouldn't be Mankind and Farouk instead of Mick Foley well, and Ron you, Simmons? You, like, just consistency. I'm, I'm okay. No, no, I'm okay with them doing that. I just don't want Hall and Nash because then that's relatable to NWO and then that's relatable to club. And we get that same segment every time they do their stupid shit where it's you know, gonna someone's going to come out... Uh, I mean, when, when oh, you have when you have Diesel, Razor, Hall and Nash, whatever you want to call them, Hulk fucking Hogan, and Eric Bischoff all in the same place at the same time, they're, they're not going to be able to help you themselves. Get away with it. You get away with it like that. Hey, you know how great would it be, too, if it wasn't even Hall and Nash and they brought back the fake guys? <laughs> yes. Hey, I'd pop for that. Yes. Uh, I'll pop for that. But, you know, and this is, it, it, the timing of this is always, it's always suspect. It, it's quite humorous as well. Uh, usually we see this thing like two weeks before, before the Royal Rumble, when they actually, or, you know, cause they do the conference call, that big financial thing right before that, or it's on the road to WrestleMania where they need to see that spike or, 
or hopefully, hopefully, you know, people will just tune in because they're going to see these names advertised, and and maybe they'll get a little interested because we run a, a SummerSlam commercial, and they remember as a kid that that they they loved this event or something, but they don't do any actual business. They're not getting the people that have been there that are following you any more invested in what's going on at that marquee event. And again, this is just it's a cheap out. Uh, they, they know they, they need something sexy. They need a little appeal going into this call, something they can brag about. And then the back end, they'll say, we, we, we popped this number. We're heading into a major marquee event. We're excited about this. And again, they're blowing smoke up your ass. And I'm not just going at WWE up on this thing. It's a, it's a standard across business, but it's a, it's a surefire sign that you know that you are struggling. Where's John fucking Cena? No John Cena. This list of names. No John Cena. Where is He's John busy. Cena? He's busy. He's busy. Doing what? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Come on. And nobody cares. Like, I'm the only person asking, where is John fucking Cena? Actually, actually, I caught some word here. Uh, well, now I see it. Just sent me a message here. Uh, everyone's kind of confused about this new format of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Uh, it's actually going to be a uh, WWE creative scouting show. That's where they're going to bring in fifth graders and see if they can write better better content than the current WWE creative team. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. You know what? I, I, always, I always thought about doing that, like a little like uh, YouTube project or something like that. Like I go get people that are uh, like senile or you know, have some kind of, uh, you know, mental handicap or I don't know, maybe they've been in, in prison for years and haven't seen any of the content. And I sit down with them and ask them to book like a month of wrestling and see if they can come up with something better than, than what's happening on WWE television. It's good shit, pal. Let's talk about Smackville. Um, this is going to be a special airing July 27th on the WWE network, but Rick, I'm hearing that this is actually going to air on Fox as well. A couple of weeks before SmackDown moves to Fox kind of as a, a primer to get you ready for the characters that are going to be on the show to get people excited about the show, making its move to Fox. These are the talents that they are advertising for this show. It's going to be. So they're going to film something and hold it, hold it in a can for months, even though it's going to air on, on the network live. Okay. So with the intent of enticing people to come watch your new live show, we're going to do something that they've, they've known results. I mean, that's like showing, like showing the Super Bowl, like NFL network showing it live in February and then see like NBC showing it in July. Uh, NBC did that with WrestleMania for years. They give you a condensed one hour version of it. Well, this is only going to be a one hour special. That's going to be on Fox. Yeah, and did you ever see those WrestleMania numbers for NBC? There's a reason they don't do it anymore. Yep, absolute trash. Uh, but I did find it interesting, the talent being advertised for the show. It's going to be Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler versus Samoa Joe for the WWE Championship. Shinsuke Nakamura takes on Finn Balor for the Intercontinental Championship. Bailey versus Charlotte versus Alexa Bliss for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Also advertised for the show New Day and a Elias in ring concert segment. That's not going to go Ooh, well, well with the Fox execs. Uh, I'm looking for that to probably get cut from uh, in transition from network to Fox. Yep. That's not going to go over well with Fox. I know there's a lot of people love Elias, but I'm telling you, the Fox Network people that want a more sports-like presentation, that they want it presented more like a sport and less like entertainment, the Elias segment ain't going to do it. Uh, yeah, you know, outside of Super Bowl, there's a reason they don't show us the halftime shows at stadiums. <laughs> yep. Um, um, so let me ask, hold on again. When, when did you say this was going to be filmed? Uh, July 27th. July 27th, and then they're going to run this thing when? I want to say two weeks before SmackDown premieres so on looking, Fox, so mid-September. you late September. Yep. Okay, so, are, are, so now are we to assume that all these individuals will still be holding their championships at this time? Fucking bingo, Rick! Fucking bingo! That's exactly where I was going with this. What the fuck? What are they doing? And, 
Well, and with that say, I mean, you can obviously put a twist. You know, this show aired on this date. We want to show you some of these stars. But, I mean... Then just show me your fucking in, highlight package from the last fucking... Yeah, I mean, you mean the WWE can't put together a one-hour-long special patting themselves on the fucking back? We got to show something that's three fucking months old? That's why I'm hoping that this information, that we're getting a bit wrong, that they're not going to hold this thing for, you know, for this Fox teaser before the actual debut there. Uh, because I mean, even while, you know, some people are going to understand, I mean, you could come out and say, you know, we filmed this in July. We want to show you what the WWE experience is all about, but this is going to be a, to a much broader audience. I mean, you're grabbing at, I mean, we're talking almost tenfold is what your potential grab is here. And it's going to be confusing as hell. If they're watching this special, even if you're, it, it, this is the consumer, this is how they work. You know, we deal with them on the daily basis in our professional life. Jared. We know how it is. You, you could tell them something. They're not going to retain it. You know, it, it, it tends to be a visual. It has to be something right there that they can feel, that they can understand. So they're going to see this thing, and then two weeks later, you're going to have a whole set of new champions. You might not even have somebody around because of injury. They might be working over on Raw or something. They might not even be involved with SmackDown. Balor might be uh, off this, TV for months at this point. Well, you, you, know, you never know with an injury or something like that that could come up. Uh, a contract. You know, we're sitting here talking about Finn. Where is he going to be at this point? Well, How's Dolph he going to be how how long is Dolph Ziggler going to be around? Right. So to me, I, I hope that 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 this kind of uh, this rumor that it is that I hope that it's wrong. And to me, why would you even need to do hold off on running out the live show, especially that you're going to do this in July and you don't even know what the presentation is going to look like on Fox? Don't show me the old. You know, the old reject, what you got on USA, save that new exciting set, that, that presentation, how you're going to flow your show for that grand opening. You know what they should do to introduce this, to tease people, is run out that studio show that we're hearing them talking about for FS1 being hosted by Renee Young. You want to, you know, have a panel sitting there, but let her bring people in for one-on-one -on -one interviews and then show vignettes, show promos that are going to highlight your top stars to get people excited. You know, it's it's called a teaser. You know, it's like a trailer at the movies. You don't give you don't give shit away. You want to get people excited. You want to entice them. It's an appetizer waiting for that main course. Just give me a WWE 365. Give me a one hour special about the last year inside of the company, who the champions are, who's struggling, who you're right. looking to break out. Like, this is not hard. WWE does it all the time. Hey, they do a tremendous job with, you know, the 365, especially though, like on the road to WrestleMania. Give us that. We don't need something filmed in July, which, which the more that we, you know, we talk about it, you hear this out loud. There's no way that can be true. There's no way that they are that, that they're that ignorant. Well, well, I guess we will find out. So that's going to wrap things up for this week's show. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. Then find the entire HTM podcast network online, hittingthemarks.com. Visit our friends over at thegorillaposition.com as they tell the stories of pro wrestling storytellers. Find Jamie and his crew over at Last Word on prowrestling.com where they give you all the news that is news from around the world of professional wrestling. You can find Huckleberry and I this Monday inside the locker room, hackerhameen.podbean.com. We'll be talking a lot of Ring of Honor this week and previewing next week's G1 Climax shows. In the meantime, you can find me across all social media platforms at NotJargo, RBV. How do the peeps, the freaks, and the geeks find you? Well, I'd like to remind everybody real quick, you know, to hit Jargo up on social media. Hit us up here, uh, you know, hitting the marks uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anywhere you, you can find me at The Real RVD. But to remind everybody, you know, one of the conversations we do want to continue over in the locker room while we're covering all the great events this weekend is we want to talk a little bit about those AEW potential uh, four horsemen S. Uh, faction that could be coming up. We want to hear what everyone's thoughts on that. Who would you put in there? And then also, hey, up to this, this point in the year, uh, we're a little past the halfway mark. Who is your top five for uh, the PWI 500? So hit us up on that. We'll touch base on that in the locker room. Also, I'd like to invite everyone on Facebook to head over to uh, facebook.com backslash herd marketing for all your hospitality, entertainment, retail, dine, and drink marketing needs. That's it for this week's show. We'll talk to you Monday in the locker room for now. We're off like a prom dress. See ya! Watch your fingers. Enable me. I don't give up. I'll be your bad guy. Stop, stop, go!
Tlaxcala. I'll be your bad guy.